Good afternoon. Today we're going to start talking a little bit about host defenses. This will be a mini immunology course. For those of you who have taken Dr. Moshewitz's immunology course, <clears throat> this should be all elementary to you. But what we're trying to do here today is give everyone a background that you need to understand the rest of the course in terms of pathogenesis. So we need you to understand basic concepts of how viruses are, are re regulated by immune responses. So that's what we're going to do today. So when we talk about host defenses, we're, we have uh, three levels. First, the intrinsic defenses, the physical uh, and chemical defenses. We've talked about this dead skin mucus, tears, low pH, etc. cetera. Uh, we, won't, we won't talk about that very much more. Today we want to deal with the innate immune system, the first thing that a pathogen sees when it infects a host, and then the adaptive immune system, the one that's tailored to the pathogen. So this is my view of immunology. As a virologist, we have three brick walls, one higher than the next. The first one is your intrinsic defenses, again, mucus, skin, etc. If viruses get over that, and it's pretty good at stopping a lot of infections, but if they go over that, they encounter innate immunity, and many infections are stopped there, but some can get over innate immunity. Then they acquire, uh, encounter acquired, and then if they get over that, you're in big trouble because you're going to be pretty sick. But these walls all talk to one another, at least the innate and acquired walls talk to one another, as we'll see today. So here's the scheme that we're going to deal with today. We have our pathogen <clears throat> and we will talk about pattern recognition receptors which will determine whether this is in fact something foreign or not. Uh, if it's not foreign, there's no innate response, there's no need to get excited. If it's recognized as foreign, we'll talk about how that happens, uh, this engages the innate immune system and the members include dendritic cells, cytokines, NK cells, complement, and all these attempt to uh, eradicate the infection. If they can't, uh, they will communicate this fact to the adaptive immune system and say, we can't handle this, you need, we need some help, and that will, the adaptive immune system will then figure out what the pathogen is and make an appropriate response. But that takes time, the adaptive immune system takes a couple of weeks, so in the meantime the innate is out there on the front line uh, preventing things from happening. So the innate immune response is always functioning in you, it doesn't have to be induced it's there, functioning continuously, the only one that's available really early after infection. And as I said, it, contain, it comprises cytokines. We'll talk about those sentinel cells, complement, and NK cells. And as I said, it will talk to the adaptive system when it can't handle the situation. <clears throat> so the, the discovery of the um, innate system begins in 1980. Uh, investigators in Germany, Nusslein, Volhard, and Wieschaus, were studying development in the fruit fly. And they were, their theory was that genes were involved in the proper pattern of development. So they were mutating flies and looking for genes that had a role in this process. And they found one gene that made a very interesting phenotype, and this was called the Toll gene. And the name came from the exclamation one of these two made, which means, you know, crazy or far out. Uh, and that stuck called the Toll gene. They got the Nobel Prize for that work in 1995. Now, this gene turned out to have a role in immunity in flies. They were not studying immunity. They were studying development. But someone else found out it had a role in immunity. And in fact, in flies and other insects, the innate system is very important because they don't make antibodies and, and cellular immunity. And in 1997, toll-like receptors were identified in mammals. So now we know that these genes are a big part of the pattern recognition uh, system that, that we use to identify uh, pathogens as foreign. So these are toll-like receptors, or TLRs. They are transmembrane proteins and they recognize uh, foreign molecular patterns. They're highly conserved in various species. And in us and in mice, there are about 13 members. There are more or less in, in other species. These are some of the toll-like receptors uh, that we have in humans and mice. They're given numbers, TLR1 through 11. And these are the various 
chemicals that they recognize as foreign. For example, triacyl lipoproteins, not something we have. Uh, viral glycoproteins, double-stranded RNA, uh, lipopolysaccharide, of course, for bacteria, single-stranded RNA, uh, CPG DNA, and, and a few other ligands. So these are the foreign ligands recognized by the innate system. The um, toll-like receptors all have a very common structure. It consists of, as I said, these are transmembrane proteins. The extracellular portion is made up of a series of leucine repeats. That is a sequence of leucine repeats repeated many times. Each of these little squares is a leucine repeat. And the structure of that is revealed on the right here. This is the x-ray structure of the extracellular domain of TLR3. You can see each leucine repeat is aligned to form this curving structure. Uh, the cytoplasmic portion of these proteins is called the tear domain because it has homology with uh, the IL-1 receptor domain, and this is very important because it initiates signaling that says, I've bound something foreign, we need to respond. The way these uh, toll-like receptors are thought to recognize foreign materials, PAMPs as we call them, is not yet fully sorted out. These are models of how they might interact with viral RNA. So this is RNA here in different positions. And the idea, one idea is that the binding of RNA leads to dimerization of the toll-like receptors, which then initiates signaling through the cytoplasmic domain. Or perhaps there are pre-existing dimers that then interact with RNA, which activates signaling as well. The main point is that whenever these uh, TLRs bind a foreign substance that they recognize as foreign, uh, then they start a signaling pathway that leads to the production of chemicals. And that's shown here. Uh, this is a summary of a variety of different signaling pathways. Some TLRs are on the plasma membrane, and they can interact with uh, viruses or viral products. And again, uh, they, uh, when they're recognized, uh, that initiates a signaling cascade. Many TLRs are in the endosome, as shown here. And these are TLRs 3, 7, 8, and 9, which recognize various nucleic acids as foreign. So as you know, these can be viral particles taken up by endocytosis, and then therefore the nucleic acid is in the endosome recognized by the TLR. So this is a very good place to put a TLR. And the binding of these foreign nucleic acids then initiates signaling cascades, which we will not discuss at all, which go through a variety of cytoplasmic proteins, ending up in the production of uh, transcripts in the nucleus for which encode various uh, effectors of the innate response, which include cytokines, here are some inflammatory cytokines made, uh, TNF and the various interleukins. We'll talk about why these are made a bit later. And also interferons are made as a result. So the TLRs send something foreign, they make cytokines, or they induce the production of cytokines. Now also, here are shown the, what we call the rig eye like helicases. These are cytoplasmic sensors of foreign molecules. Uh, one of them is Rig I, another one is MDA5. Uh, these recognize nucleic acids and respond in a very similar way by inducing the synthesis of, of cytokines in the nucleus. So, yes? When the endosome gets acidified, does that increase the, um, the connection between these different foreign pathogens and the TLRs? Uh, you're asking whether low pH improves the sensing of this. Uh, I believe that this is the case. I'm, I'm vaguely remembering some studies where they used inhibitors of acidification and showed that this impaired signaling, but I don't know if it's at the level of recognition of the foreign nucleic acid or something else. Yeah. The uh, cytoplasmic RLR helicases uh, exist in the cytoplasm in an inactive form. Uh, this is what they look like here. So they consist of a card domain, a helicase domain, and a C-terminal domain. And the idea is that the C-terminal domain recognizes the nucleic acid as foreign. And when it does, it unfolds the protein, and then it can go on and signal. You'll see how it does that in a moment. This, these helicases recognize as foreign either double-stranded RNA now, double-stranded RNA is not typically found in an uninfected cell, so that's foreign right away. 
or single-stranded RNA with 5' prime phosphates. This is also not found in the cytoplasm. Typically, RNAs are either capped or they have other modifications or sequestered in ribosomes. So these are both recognized by these helicases as foreign. Yes? Mm -hmm. So you're asking whether these, these helicases might detect aberrant cellular RNAs. But the, the end point would be the production of cytokines, so I'm not sure it would help. I don't know of any example of that in any case. Do you know, Saul? Right. I mean, there are, other, there are other systems that deal with aberrant RNAs in the cell. So, yes? Is it, does this interfere with one interfere with the processing of the double strand of RNA by the virus or yeah, like a PKR response? Well, the PKR response is actually similar, right? So the PKR recognizes double stranded RNA and activates, uh, it phosphorylates EIF2. It's a different pathway, it inhibits translation. Um, so they, they act independently. They don't inhibit, they don't interfere with each other. Not with each no. other, but does RIG-1 inhibit translation of the double-stranded RNA as well? Or is it just... Well, so, yeah, cytokine? as you will see, the, when RIG-I uh, recognizes RNA, the end result is production of many, many antiviral proteins that have different modes of, of action. So some of them could, in fact, interfere. I'm going to talk about a couple of those, yeah. But rig eye doesn't do it directly. It's through other proteins. Um, all right, so that's how these helicases work. And here's a, an overview of the helicases in action in the cytoplasm. Again, rig eye or MDA5. They recognize, again, either double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA with 5' phosphates. They're activated, and their activation allows them to bind a protein in the mitochondrial membrane called MAVs. Um, and then that interaction then stimulates a variety of phosphorylation cascades. There are three different ones shown here, leading to the activation of different transcription factors, which then go in the nucleus. So we have IRF3 or 7, uh, NF-kappa B, J JNK. Um, and many of these involve phosphorylation events. And the details are absolutely not um, something that we need to go into. We don't know why this has to be a mitochondrial protein, uh, but if you, dis if you dissociate MAVs from the mitochondrial membrane, Rig I and MDA5 do not engage in signaling. It's quite interesting. All right, so again, the cytoplasm, uh, these RNAs are present. So many viruses, you remember from our discussion of virus entry, put their RNAs in the cytoplasm, independent of uh, endocytosis. So these sensors are presumably there to sense them. And again, the re result in the end is the production of cytokines. Here we're showing the production of just one interferon beta, uh, but other interferons are produced as well. And we will talk about what they do uh, in a moment. So interferons were discovered in the 1950s by Isaacs and Lindemann, who found that they would infect chicken cells with influenza. And the medium of those infected cells, if they put it on fresh cells, would inhibit infection of those cells with virus. So they said there's something here that interferes with virus replication. And they called that interferon. They coined the term uh, interferon. And the first to be made after infection are, are the so-called alpha-beta uh, interferons. Later, we get gamma interferon. And these are produced by a variety of cells. But of course, the first ones that would produce them would be those cells that the virus first encounters. So if this is a respiratory mucosa here, uh, these cells are infected with a virus, they're going to produce interferon. And that interferon uh, will then diffuse here, and its action, as you will see, will be to try and prevent infection of other cells uh, in this epithelium. Uh, as we'll see also, there are this, the cytokines produced by these infected cells attract other cells to the infected area. They will attract uh, macrophages and dendritic cells, and those cells will also produce interferon in an attempt to quell the spread of the infection. <clears throat> 
so here are three of the of the interferon types. There's a, a new one, uh, interferon lambda, discovered very recently, mainly produced by epithelial cells. Seems to be very important for uh, infections at epithelial surfaces. Uh, but then there are alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha and beta produced by most cells. They're induced by uh, viral infection and interferon gamma largely produced by T cells and NK cells. So uh, these are alpha and beta interferons, their production is, is quite rapid. They go up very quickly and then they decline by 10 hours. They do have side effects, so you don't want to be making these all the time. Uh, there are many interferon alpha genes, over 20, and they are differentially expressed depending on the tissue and the invader. And there is one interferon beta gene, which again is made very quickly uh, for a short period after infection. They induce an antiviral state. Uh, they themselves induce the transcription of many, many genes. Uh, they are called interferon stimulated genes. There are over a thousand of them. And those uh, encode proteins that are designed to stop virus infection. And most of them are unknown as to their uh, mechanism of action. This is actually one of the things we study in my lab, how ISGs work to inhibit uh, virus infection. So I'm going to tell you about some of the known ISGs just to get you a flavor. But remember, there are over a thousand of them. They're probably made differently in different cells in response to different viruses. Yeah. So many people get uh, interferon therapy for infections. Hepatitis C is treated with interferon. Um, and the problem with having a lot of um, interferon around, it induces all these other gene products that have various effects that can cause fever, inflammation. Um, so you don't want to have it. So in, the cell, in us, it, their production is tightly regulated. You don't want to keep making them continuously. And as an example, I, I use therapy with interferons in people, which is problematic. Uh, you know, it doesn't always work, and a lot of the patients get uh, very bad side effects. So. So the way these interferon-stimulated genes, ISGs, are produced, the interferon, remember, produced in that original infected cell, goes outside the cell and binds interferon receptors. And there are, there are three shown here. Uh, interferon alpha-beta is a common receptor, type 1 interferon, type 2 the interferon gamma receptor, and then this is a receptor for another cytokine. Uh, these molecules bind receptors on the cell surface, and that in induces a signaling cascade. Uh, the signaling occurs when the ligands bind. There is phosphorylation of the receptors themselves uh, by protein kinases, tick and jack. Uh, these phosphorylate stat proteins, which are resident in the cell. Uh, the stats dimerize in various ways and then enter the nucleus as transcription factors. And they bind to very specific sequences in the upstream regions of ISGs. Uh, <clears throat> for one, one example is for the uh, the interferon type 2 stimulated genes bind the ISRE, the interferon response element, interferon stimulating response element. And this is a very specific promoter a sequence in the promoter that stimulates uh, the production of the ISGs. So here we have a transcription factor essentially uh, stimulating the production of ISG mRNAs. And again, this transcription factor is produced only when interferon binds the receptor. <clears throat> So let's talk about a couple of ISGs just to give you an example of, of how these work. Uh, PKR is an ISG. So we talked about PKR a couple of weeks ago. It is a protein induced by infection, but it's an interferon stimulated gene. And remember, it is activated by double stranded RNA. It becomes autophosphorylated. And then it in turn phosphorylates EIF2 to inhibit translation. So the response is to shut down translation and maybe that will get rid of the virus infection. So PKR is quite broadly acting. Uh, it can inhibit many viruses, because remember, they all depend on the host translation apparatus to the one. In addition to inhibiting translation, EI, phosphorylated EIF2 alpha can also trigger autophagy, programmed cell death. So this is another uh, innate response to infection, to kill the cell, and maybe that will limit uh, virus infection. Another one is RNA-L, two proteins, RNA-L. 
and 2 prime, 5 prime oligo A synthetase. These are two ISG products that work together. The first, uh, 2 prime, 5 prime OAS, is normally synthesized as an inactive protein. And again, it's, a, it's a synthesized in response to interferon. It is activated by double-stranded RNA, again, a viral-specific nucleic acid. And once it's activated, it can then take ATP and synthesize from it oligo-A, sequences of A. Okay? Those oligo-A sequences then activate RNA cell, which is another ISG produced in an inactive form. Uh, once it's active, it can then degrade mRNA. All right, so another three, three examples, PKR, OAS, and RNA cell of proteins that are made inactively and they have to be activated by virus infection. So in this case, it degrades the viral uh, RNA. It will also probably degrade cellular mRNA as well, but you see uh, these responses don't always have specificity uh, for the virus. They will degrade the cell in which the virus is replicating. MX proteins, another class of ISGs. Uh, these were first discovered in mice. Uh, these are proteins induced by interferon. In mice, they, these are nuclear proteins, and they block the ability of influenza virus polymerase to, to take the cap from cellular messenger RNAs, which you may remember is required for priming of influenza virus mRNA synthesis. So these interfere, these MX1 proteins interfere with priming of viral mRNAs. And so many studies were done in mice with this protein. The only problem is influenza virus does not infect mice in the wild. And as far as we know, about a quarter of wild mice don't even have uh, the MX gene, and they're fine. So it must have some other function, and it just so happens that it inhibits influenza replication. But in humans, there are two related genes, and these, in fact, do have antiviral uh, properties. They are interferon-stimulated genes, and they... Uh, inhibit a variety of viruses, as you can see here. So it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, a lead was obtained from a mouse gene that doesn't have any antiviral functions that we know of. Nitric oxide synthase is another interferon-stimulated gene. This is inter induced by interferon gamma. Uh, nitric oxide synthase takes arginine and makes uh, nitric oxide from it. And nitric oxide has a number of antiviral effects. It can be conjugated to proteins, which inactivates them, or it can be used uh, to, pr to produce peroxynitrite, which is an oxidative radical that can also damage uh, proteins. And the idea is that these will damage viruses, viral proteins, viral particles in an infected area, and possibly will limit uh, the infection. And uh, this NK cells, which are one of the sentinel cells of the, um, or one of the cells of the innate response, depend a lot on nitric oxide synthase for their antiviral activity. So in this diagram here, we're showing a infected epithelial layer. Uh, here are some virus particles being produced, and the infection has resulted in the production of cytokines. This is recruiting immune cells to the infected area, and if these are NK cells, they're going to produce uh, nitric oxide and peroxynitrite, nitrite, and, and this will damage the cells. So the, the epithelium will be damaged, but perhaps the replication will be limited. So another example of sort of a nonspecific uh, action of one of these ISGs. Uh, this actually contributes to viral pathology because in mouse models, if you knock out the gene for nitric oxide synthase, some virus infections are actually less um, pathogenic, I, I should say, less tissue damage is caused when you get rid of this gene. So this is going to be a recurring theme. The immune response is going to be a double-edged sword in virus infection. It's going to end up causing a lot of the pathology. Uh, the trade-off is getting rid of the infection. A couple more ISGs, PML, promyelocytic bodies. These are uh, assemblies that are present in the nucleus. They are called various things, PMLs, ND10s, pods. You'll see them that way in the literature. They bind foreign DNA, and they uh, have antiviral effects, which they exert through uh, repression of transcription and remodeling nucleosomes. So these have antiviral effects. Viruses don't like them to be around. So many virus infections disrupt 
uh, the formation of PML bodies. And you might hear about these again in a couple of days. Uh, the ubiquitin proteasome pathway is also a target of, uh, or, or has c components of uh, them are ISGs. ISG15 is a small ubiquitin-like protein that's conjugated uh, to cell proteins, which would degrade them. These would be then conjugated to viral proteins and degrade them as well. There are also ubiquitin ligases, the enzymes that conjugate ubiquitin to proteins. These are ISGs as well. So basically, uh, part of the ISG response is to increase general protein degradation. Not specific, but again, succeeding in getting rid of virus infection. And an, an interesting um, illustration of the importance of this ubiquitin proteasome pathway is the fact that you can uh, block the an inhibitory action of interferon by using inhibitors of the proteasome. These are compounds that inhibit uh, the proteasome from degrading ubiquitinated proteins. So this is apparently important in clearing uh, hepatitis B virus infection. <clears throat> this is a very interesting ISG, pretty recently discovered. It's called tetherin. <clears throat> and tetherin is a very unusual protein which spans the lipid bilayer of the cell. So it's present on the plasma membrane. So it starts, the end terminus is in the cytoplasm. It goes through the membrane. There's an extracellular part, and then it's anchored. Its C-terminus is anchored by a GPI uh, anchoring linkage. So very unusual conformation. It's present on the cell surface. And what it does is it prevents the release of a variety of envelope viruses when they try and butt off. So you see here is an example where um, the tethering molecules, which are shown in green, are tethering the virions of HIV to the cell surface. So these virions have just budded, but they contain tetherin, and so they're linked to one another and to the cell membrane. So it's a very unusual protein. You can see the structure of it here, an extended alpha helical structure. So you may ask, how does HIV succeed in getting around this? Well, it encodes proteins that antagonize the action of tetherin. Otherwise, HIV wouldn't exist. And that's the case for many of these ISGs. There seem to be viral antagonists. Other ISGs, ISG56, uh, binds a subunit of EIF3. You remember EIF3 is a component of the initiation complex. It links the ribosome to EIF4G. ISG56 seems to bind that and inhibit that. It doesn't have any specificity, but again, the idea is to block virus replication. Even microRNAs can be viewed as ISGs now. For example, um, if you treat liver cells with interferon beta, among other things that are induced, you get a bunch of microRNAs, and some of those inhibit viral replication. So they're interferon-induced microRNAs. Interestingly, so here, that was an example where interferon induces antiviral microRNAs. MIR-122, you may remember we talked about a while ago, is actually required for hep C replication. This is a liver-specific microRNA. Interferon treatment reduces its expression. So that's, that's really amazing, I think. This is reducing its expression, and that is one of the mechanisms by which uh, the interferons quell it, hep C replication. Okay, so those are some of the ISGs. Those are just a handful. There are over 1,000. It's a lot more to understand there as well. Let's talk a little bit about the sentinel cells. Um, these are dendritic cells and macrophages that will come to an infected epithelium as soon as there's infection and cytokines are produced. So they're attracted there by the cytokines. Uh, these were, so the dendritic cells, very important components, first des described by Paul Langerhans a long time ago. These were really made famous by Ralph Steinman uh, here and Cohn. This is Ralph Steinman who worked at Rockefeller. We. Um, did a TWIV on him not too long ago. He died a day after receiving the Nobel Prize. Okay, so the Nobel Committee couldn't reach him, so they announced that he had gotten the Nobel Prize, and then they found out that he was dead. And you know, you can't receive the prize posthumously, but they decided that he could keep it since they didn't know he had died. So he got it for discovering these dendritic cells in 1973 and doing a lot of work to help us understand how they, how they work. 
So that's Ralph right there. <clears throat> Dendritic cells are pretty much uh, all over you. They're patrolling. They're making sure there isn't any trouble. Um, here is a nice photograph of uh, a dendritic cell. It's labeled with green, and it's interacting with a T cell, which is blue, near, near a blood vessel. And this is one of the things that dendritic cells do, as you'll see. They like to talk to T cells. So they're found all over you. They contain uh, toll-like receptors. They have MDI, MDA5 and Rig I in their cytoplasms. They have cytokine receptors. So they are primed to do a number of things. So when they sense, if they are brought to an infected epithelium, they will make interferons. And then if the cells are dying, they will take up pieces of the dead and dying cells and see if they're foreign. And if they are foreign, they have receptors for knowing TLRs, for example. They will then go to the lymph node with a piece of, say, a peptide in, uh, in an MHC molecule on their surface and then talk to the T cells. Basically saying, we have a problem here. You need to start working on this. And that's the link, one of the main links between the innate and the adaptive systems. These sentinels, dendritic cells, which go from the infected area to uh, the lymph node. So they produce interferons. As I said, they go to the infected epithelium. They make interferons, and that will inhibit infection. And so you can imagine that if they tip the balance, if they make enough interferon and the infection is stopped, then that's the end of it. They don't have to take any peptides back to the T cells. But if infection reaches or passes a certain threshold, uh, then they have to go into the lymph node and inform the T cells. So dendritic cells are pretty important. So as I said, they're present, uh, they're circulating in us as uh, immature or inactive dendritic cells. They look like this. They have toll-like receptors. Uh, they have MHC class II molecules in the endosome. And of course, if these get infected or if they take up virus particles by endocytosis, uh, the proteins will be degraded and presented eventually uh, in the context of class II on the, on the DC surface to a T cell. They have cytokine receptors, so they can respond to cytokines being produced by infected cells, and they make interferon. So if they, get, if they go somewhere and they get cytokines and pieces of dead and dying cells, virus-infected cells, they get activated. And they become this very typical dendritic morphology with the, uh, the, fibrous, um, the fibers sticking out. Uh, and they have MHC class II on the surface. And they will go into the lymph node and find naive T cells and then present them the peptides, which are these orange blocks here. So the T cell will interact with the peptide in the context of MHC. Uh, and then the T cells will mature. Uh, becoming various types of T cells depending on the cytokines that are produced. So then the T cells can go on and do their thing, as we'll talk about in a minute. So the, again, the, the DCs can limit the initial infection, but it can also start to activate the uh, adaptive response. Now, DCs can also act as <clears throat> Trojan horses. So here are a couple of examples of that. Um, there is a protein on the surface of DCs called DC sign. It will actually bind HIV. Now, HIV does not get into the DCs, but it binds to this molecule. And then, of course, the DCs are going into the lymph node because this is, this is an infection going on and there's trouble, so they're going to go in the lymph node. And what kind of cell does HIV like to replicate in? T cells, which are in the lymph node, of course. So unwittingly, uh, the DCs are bringing HIV right where it wants to replicate. Uh, another virus, Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus, can actually replicate in DCs. Not all viruses can do that. They can replicate. They get into the lymph nodes, and infection is spread uh, that way. And so this is actually being pursued as a vaccine strategy because getting uh, antigen into the lymph node is a good thing, as you will see, because you get a good adaptive response. You don't want it to kill, you don't want the virus to kill you. So if you could make an attenuated vaccine strain that got to the lymph node, uh, this could be a good uh, vaccine strategy. So people are trying to figure out how to do that and maintain the ability to be brought into uh, lymph nodes. Uh, in general, if you infect DCs, it's not a good thing. Uh, because you can interfere with, you can kill the DCs. If the virus kills the DCs, of course, you're going to have a poor adaptive response against it. You can interfere with maturation, even the movement, uh, and all of that stuff. So viruses often do not replicate them, but when they do, they have bad uh, results. Okay, so those are 
a, a little history of DCs. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is complement. Uh, the complement cascade is a collection of, of serum proteins which have a major role in uh, innate and adaptive defenses. They were discovered a long time ago because they complemented the ability to lyse bacteria. So um, serum added to bacteria could lyse them, but complement was a fraction of serum that even improved that lytic ability. So that's why it's called complement. So it's a collection of proteins that can recognize in a, in a similar way as TLRs recognize uh, molecules as foreign, I can recognize them and help engage various defenses, as you will see. And this works early in infection, so it can be working with the innate response, and then it can work later when antibodies uh, are made. And it has four uh, general functions. It can make holes in cells, can poke holes in cells and kill them. Uh, and it recognizes those cells as foreign because they may have a foreign protein on their surface or they may have an antibody bound to a viral protein. Uh, they can make cytokines that help activate inflammation, which we'll talk about in a moment. They can coat viruses and help them be taken up by macrophages. That's called opsonization. It also occurs with bacteria. And of course, once they are phagocytosed, the virus particles can be destroyed. And they can also solubilize immune complexes. When you're making a vigorous antibody response against the pathogen, uh, often you get uh, antibody antigen complexes forming that can be pathogenic in themselves. They can clog small capillaries in various tissues and complement often functions to dissolve these so they aren't a problem. So complement has a wide range of functions. Here are a couple of them illustrated in this diagram. Uh, there, there are many components of the complement cascade shown here. An important initial one is a protein called uh, C1 uh, and various variants, C1Q, RNS, et cetera. Uh, these proteins can recognize uh, an infected cell as foreign or an infected, it can recognize even virus particles. So these complement proteins will recognize a virus particle as, as foreign or a uh, viral protein in an infected cell. So they have pattern recognition capabilities. And that recognition leads to multimerization and the triggering of a complement cascade. So the formation of these C1 molecules, again, in response to binding a pathogen or a protein uh, in, the member of, in the membrane of an infected cell leads to a bunch of cascades, which are cleavage cascades, the production of various proteins which can induce inflammation uh, they can recruit immune cells to the infected area. And even at the end, the formation of this membrane attack complex, which pokes holes in the infected cell membrane. So all this is triggered by complement recognizing something as foreign, either a virus particle, an infected cell, or even antibodies bound to uh, the cell surface. So this, of course, is a late function of complement, because antibodies take at least two weeks to make. But early on, the complement molecules can can recognize um, virus particles. And then again, the main results are inflammation and lysis of cells. <clears throat> so let's talk about inflammation now. We've, we've mentioned this term a couple times. What does it mean? So remember, when you are infected, very early on, your infected cells produce cytokines. And that recruits immune cells, sentinels that produce even more cytokines. And among these are TNF-alpha tumor necrosis factor alpha, a very early cytokine, which is a major inducer of inflammation. This is a so-called pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine. And one of the effects of TNF-alpha and other pro-inflammatory cytokines, redness, pain, heat, and swelling. These are the four signs of inflammation. They have been known since the Roman days. They were called rubor dolor, calor and tumor. And they are a consequence of the production of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So inflammation is defined by these four conditions. And what's happening is cytokines are produced that lead to increased blood flow, increased blood vessel permeability, uh, the influx of phagocytic cells into the region, and swelling and tissue damage. 
And all of this is meant to try and quell the infection. So for example, increasing uh, capillary permeability to get fluids out of the capillaries and into uh, the lymph system so they can be sampled for foreign antigens. All right, so all of these symptoms of inflammation are a result of the production of cytokines and the consequent effect on the infected area. So here is a uh, diagram that attempts to summarize uh, all of this. We have an area where there is an infection, an epithelial monolayer where viruses are replicating. There are foreign antigens present. Uh, and these, this replication, of course, has recruited uh, dendritic cells to the area. And these have now sampled some antigens. They're heading to the lymph node. And as you know, we have an extensive lymph circulatory system. So the, the sampling can occur close to a site of infection or far away. At the same time, complement can recognize the presence. This is another early action, can recognize the presence uh, of uh, foreign antigens. It can lead to coding them for phagocytosis, so-called opsonization. It can lead to the production of uh, effectors that, in, that recruit uh, phagocytic cells from the blood circulation. And of course, uh, at, while this is happening, uh, cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines are being produced, uh, which increase permeability, also increase recruitment, and give you the four signs of inflammation. So there's all kinds of interactions between uh, the infected area, uh, dendritic cells, the complement system, and cytokines. So this is what inflammation is, this whole orchestra of of activities that result in those four symptoms. Now, cytokines work, are meant to work locally, but of course they get into the circulation, they get into the blood and the lymph circulation, so they end up being all, everywhere. And that's why when you get um, an infection, you have systemic symptoms. You get tired, you feel uh, dizzy, you get a headache, you get um, fever, all of this is because the cytokines are circulating everywhere and they have various targets other than what they are intended. So these pro-inflammatory pro cytokines eventually get into your brain where they cause fever, fatigue, and sleep. Um, others, other, other cytokines produced as a result of early infections uh, end up going into the bone marrow and stimulate hematopoiesis. This, of course, will give you more immune cells which you need uh, to help combat the infection. So hematopoiesis will help make more lymphocytes come out into the blood and go to the infected area. So the inflammation has an important role to localize um, and detect infections, but it has systemic effects. So this is why you feel the way you do with many viral infections. You have these general symptoms that can't be ascribed to any particular virus. That's because these cytokines are soluble. They can go everywhere. These are just some of the different types of cytokines. We've talked about pro-inflammatory cytokines. There are also anti-inflammatory cytokines because you always have to regulate immune reactions. If you just made pro-inflammatory cytokines, you might over cause over-inflammation. So there are uh, mediators that go the other way. They suppress the activity of these. And then there are chemokines which recruit cells. So your infected cells will make chemokines and they help recruit DCs and macrophages to the infected area. So inflammation is really important for not only regulating an infection but uh, determining um, what kind of an immune response you get. So to get a really good adaptive immune response requires inflammation because this allows uh, the innate and the adaptive systems to communicate with each other. Viruses that kill cells, cytopathic viruses, they, they kill cells, they cause cell damage. The DCs will pick up the broken cells and make lots of cytokines and that will cause inflammation and then the DCs will end up communicating well with the T cells in the lymph node. So these Cytopathic viruses are really good at um, making an immune response. You will notice that in the genomes of the very big uh, DNA viruses, like these three, there are always viral proteins that antagonize this inflammatory response. 
because it's so effective at clearing infections. So a good inflammatory response gives you a good adaptive response, and that's not good for the virus. So viruses have evolved to overcome that. And there are many proteins that antagonize various aspects of the inflammatory response as a consequence. So in a way, inflammation is good. Cell damage is good because it leads to inflammation, which leads to a good immune response, all right? Now, <clears throat> some viruses do not cause cell damage. I think we have mentioned this a few times. Some viruses, even in cell culture, when you infect cells, they, don't, they replicate, but there's no cell damage. In an animal, these would be really bad at inducing inflammatory responses because they don't cause cell damage. If there isn't cell damage, the DCs, for example, don't have any, anything to go on. They don't have any dead and dying cell parts to pick up and use to uh, activate a T cell with. So non-cytopathic viruses have really uh, low ability to induce inflammation. And as a consequence, we make poor immune responses against them. We make poor adaptive responses. And they tend to persist in us. They don't get cleared. So uh, arena viruses, Lassa, paramyxoviruses, measles, uh, these are examples of viruses that can persist in us because they don't kill cells, they don't induce inflammation, and we don't mount a good adaptive response against them. So this is a really important part of, of, a, of viral pathogenesis, recognizing the, the idea that inducing inflammation, killing cells is really important for that, and it's important for clearing infection. So the lesson is this, um, this inflammation, these four signs of inflammation, represents the signaling between the innate uh, and the adaptive responses. If we don't have this inflammation, there's no signaling, and we have a lousy adaptive response, and the virus can persist. And this is one reason why we use adjuvants in viral vaccines. So many viral vaccines are inactive. They're not infectious, right? They're in, in, as we'll see when we talk about vaccines, they are inactivated with chemicals or some other way so that you, when, you're, when they're injected into you, they don't replicate. They don't kill cells you get a lousy inflammatory response and you get a poor adaptive response. The whole goal of, in a, of a vaccine, of course, is to make an adaptive response because that has memory associated with it. But a vaccine that doesn't replicate cannot do that. And that's often why in these vaccines we add an adjuvant. An adjuvant is a chemical that stimulates inflammation. It stimulates the productions of cytokines, the four signs of inflammation, and a good communication between the innate uh, in the adaptive responses. For a virus like Which one? Which Hep, hep B, Hep A, G, E? So, so a virus can replicate and not cause damage. It doesn't have to be quiescent. There are certainly examples of that where the genome is quiet and nothing is going on. But there are also examples of replicating viruses. They're making viral proteins, but they're not damaging cells. So the innate system can't respond and cause inflammation as a consequence. So that's what we, that's what we mean. Uh, I was talking about the ones that usually create damage and cause problems when they're replicating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just because they're not making gene products then, right? So they're not even detected uh, by the immune response, right? Okay, so we're going to talk about vaccines a bit later. A number of our vaccines that we use in this country have adjuvants just for this reason, to induce inflammation. That's why we need to get uh, what we need to get a good adaptive response. So let's summarize this so far. We've got uh, our epithelial cell monolayer, respiratory, alimentary, whatever. We get viruses infecting it, uh, virus replication. It's detected as foreign. The cells make cytokines. They make interferons. They make pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines. Uh, the interferons, as you know, will try and 
prevent the, the other cells in the area from getting infected. The cytokines will attract uh, our dendritic cells. We'll get an immature dendritic cell here. It will start to mature as cytokines bind to its receptors as it picks up viral antigens. Uh, and eventually, uh, the, the dendritic cell, of course, will make interferon. If the infection cannot be cleared, uh, the DC will go into the lymph node. Its movement there is facilitated by inflammation, which makes things more permeable. Lymph capillaries, for example. We'll go to the lymph node, and there it will present viral antigens to T cells. And uh, those T cells will then respond. So it presents viral antigens, and, and they exchange cytokines as well. Uh, and the T cells will start to mature. And eventually, we get adaptive immunity. We get T cells and antibodies produced as a consequence of uh, the failure of the innate system to limit infection. So to summarize the innate system, before we move on to making antibodies and, and cells, uh, it, it's made up of cytokines, pattern detectors, NK cells, and complement. We've talked about all of these. It really takes care of, of, of the vast majority of infections. I think most of the time the DCs never get into the lymph node because everything is cleared at the initial site of infection. A few cells are infected. Interferon works well to limit infection. Uh, but if, it, if the innate system cannot limit infection, remember, it then has the option to go to the adaptive system and say, we need to start making uh, antibodies and cells. But that takes time, and so this innate responses give uh, the host a little bit of time uh, before it's overwhelmed. All right, so let's start talking about uh, adaptive responses. These are the ones tailored to the pathogen. And for the most part, these are essential uh, for getting rid of infection, all right, um, for clearing it. So an innate response can clear can prevent infection very early on, but if it proceeds beyond that, uh, if it infects many tissues, for example, then we need an adaptive response in order to clear it. So let's talk a little bit about that. Now this is a very brief summary of adaptive responses just to give us a framework for what we're gonna talk about uh, in subsequent lectures. And here we have our antigens at the top here. They can be proteins, viruses, bacteria, uh, whatever. And the animal responds, of course, to make two kinds of adaptive responses. It makes an antibody or humoral response. It recognizes the foreign antigens by receptors on the surfaces of B cells, which are specific for foreign particles. Uh, the recognition by the B cell leads to production of antibody secreting plasma cells, which are specific uh, to the antigen. And of course, these go through many cycles of maturation in the lymph node to tailor the antibody so that it's a perfect fit uh, for the antigen. So in the end, the antibodies are made uh, and they will interact with viruses in ways that we'll talk about in a moment. We had a great uh, podcast with a fellow from Rockefeller who actually worked on how B cells mature in the lymph node and how they go through multiple rounds of maturation. Uh, so that, that was really informative. All right, so that's our antibody response. Uh, foreign antigens also elicit T cell responses, the cell mediated response. We have precursors in, in the bone marrow and maturing through the thymus. And eventually these naive T cells make their way to the lymph node. And there they wait for some information. They wait for information from uh, a dendritic cell, for example, which has a foreign uh, peptide on it, and it will instruct uh, the T cells. Now, the T cells can be, be, be either CD4 cells uh, or TH helper cells, which secrete cytokines of various sorts. Depending on what kind of helper cell they are, they can secrete cytokines uh, that help cytotoxic T cells mature, or they can secrete cytokines that help B cells mature. So you can see that what the dendritic cell does in the lymph node can have an impact on the maturation of antibodies. So we have helper cells making two kinds of cytokines, and then we have CD8 positive T cells, which eventually mature uh, into killer cells, CTLs, which will then migrate out of the lymph node to the infected area. And their job is to kill virus infected cells. And they recognize those cells as foreign because the cells have uh, peptides on their surface presented in 
uh, MHC molecules, the T cells recognize those as foreign, and then they kill the infected cell. So this is, again, something started by dendritic cells once the infection proceeds past a certain threshold. <clears throat> so let's talk a bit about antibodies first. Antibodies are important to protect you, and that's why vaccines work. That's why when you're infected, you don't get infected again by the same virus because you have antibodies uh, that work very well at present preventing infection. Uh, the way they work largely is to bind to virus particles either in the blood or on mucosal surfaces. We have a certain kind of antibody IgA that is brought across the mucosal surface and it sits on the surfaces mixed with the mucus and will neutralize virus infectivity. And by, we will talk about neutralization uh, in a moment. Now, so antibodies protect you from infection. For the most part, most cases, antibodies protect you from infection. There are a number of cases where you need them for recovery as well. In other words, if you take an animal and you take away their antibody response, uh, they will not recover from a virus infection because the antibodies are part of the recovery as well. So classically, we've always felt that cell-mediated responses are important for recovery, but it turns out that antibodies are important as well. Never, nothing is ever black and white uh, in biology. So here's an experiment showing how an antibody will prevent infection. So these are animals that uh, have been given antibody in the form of serum. This is a passive immunization. You give antibodies, and there's different amounts of antibody here uh, from low to high titers given to the animals. And then they're infected with polio, and we're looking at percent paralysis here on the y-axis. So the controls, they get no antibody, 100% paralysis. Uh, and then as you give more and more antibody, you see you get less and less paralysis. So we are protecting the animals from infection by giving them antibody. It's a very simple relationship. And this is why vaccines work in us. They prevent us from getting infected. But as I said, some, in some cases, you also need them for recovery from infection. Now, how do antibodies work? So they bind virus particles, and they neutralize their infectivity. So that's a term you will hear a lot talking about neutralizing antibodies, blocking infection. But how do they work? Uh, they probably work in a variety of ways. Here we're illustrating how they work using uh, the entry of rhinovirus into cells. So remember, viruses have to bind receptors. Some of them get taken up by receptor-mediated endocytosis and uncoating. So antibodies can interfere with a number of these steps. So they can coat the virus particles and prevent them from attaching to receptors. Uh, they can also um, block endocytosis. They can prevent the virus from being taken up into endosomes. Or they can block uncoating. Antibodies can be bound to the virus, taken up into endosomes, and even as the endosome pH drops, the virus will not uncoat because the antibody is bound, preventing the changes, the structural changes that are needed for uncoating. So a number of different mechanisms. There's no single mechanism of neutralization. But that's what we mean. We mean blocking infectivity by antibodies. Not all antibodies will do this. They have to bind to just the right place on the virus. So what is the right place? Well, it depends on the virus. On the left is a model of rhinovirus. And the sites where antibodies can bind that will block infectivity are shown in white. So you see they're limited. That's not every amino acid in the capsid. So only antibodies in these very specific areas will, make, will block infectivity. If, you, if antibodies are made that bind over here, these will have no effect on infectivity. They may bind the particle, but they won't block its infectivity. Uh, on the right is a diagram of the hemagglutinin of influenza virus. And there are three different strains shown here. But what is important, if you remember, the hemagglutinin has a globular head. And that is where the sialic acid receptor fits into. These green circles are uh, the sites where antibodies will bind to the HA that block infectivity. All right, so these are the analogous sites to these on rhinovirus. These are the sites uh, that antibodies need to bind to to block infectivity. Not anywhere else on the molecule. And these sites are subject to mutation. 
as influenza virus is circulating in people, these sites mutate. So the antibodies you make today against today's strain of flu will not probably work in a year or two because that site will have changed enough so the antibodies can't bind. We'll talk about this more later, but that is why you need to get a flu vaccine every year because the virus changes continuously and the, the places where the antibodies bind change enough so the antibodies no longer bind so they don't neutralize infectivity. Okay, so that's an, a brief view of antibody-mediated immunity. Cell-mediated immunity, T cells, um, are, as I said before, important for clearing many virus infections. But not, not to rule out antibody, but cells are very important for most infections. And this is the Th1 response, which involves cytotoxic, the generation of cytotoxic T lymphocytes, the Th1 helper cells make cytokines that mature the CDHs to become killer cells. So cytotoxic T cells, remember, recognize an infected cell as foreign by, by nature of, uh, by virtue of there being a foreign peptide on the cell surface in, a, in an MHC molecule. They form a tight synapse with the infected cell and they kill it in a variety of ways. They can, they can lyse the cell uh, by using uh, by delivering granules that have uh, proteins that cause membrane lysis and that will kill the cell. Or they can induce apoptosis by engaging ligands in the target cell. So these are two ways that the T cells can get rid of that infected cell. Right? So the idea is you lyse the cell so that you prevent the production of new virus particles. This will, of course, cause damage. It's going to damage your tissue. And a lot of the damage that you see in a virus-infected animal is, a, is the a cause of CTL mediated lysis. And in fact, sometimes it's, it's, it's worse than the actual virus disease. So sometimes the immune response uh, is, is over aggressive. So that's why we, we are trying to understand it in the hopes that one day we might be able to modulate it. So here is an experiment where we are looking to see how important is antibody versus uh, cellular immunity in pro protecting monkeys against infection with monkeypox. So this is a virus related to smallpox. So we are infecting, so first we are vaccinating um, all of these animals on day zero and we do a manipulation of some sort and then we challenge them at day 28. So we give them about three weeks to let antibodies or cellular responses develop. So we immunize them at day zero. And these, these monkeys, there's nothing done to them. They're the control group. Uh, on day 22, they've made a high titer of antibody. You infect them, um, they're all protected against infection. None of them die. So we're measuring uh, success of the vaccination by fatal infection. So these, these animals are protected. If you do the same thing and you deplete the monkeys of B cells three times, you can deplete them by an adding antibodies to B cells, you now see they have far lower antibody titers. And then when you challenge them, three out of four of them die. So clearly, antibody is very important for uh, protecting against infection. If you do a similar experiment, you vaccinate and then deplete CD8 cells. These are the cells that will become CTLs. You deplete them on various days, again, with an antibody to CD8 cells. Uh, then you see that doesn't affect the antibody titer. You infect them, they're all protected. So protection, in this case, does not at all depend on the cellular response. It depends entirely uh, on the antibody response. And you can do similar experiments with different viruses and different animal models and get opposite results or a combination of the two. So that's why I say here, for some infections, the CTL response is more important, or vice versa. It can go either way, depending on the animal. So how, how is this determined? How is it determined what is more important, the antibody or the cellular response? And that is really something that happens when uh, the dendritic cells go into the lymph node and begin instructing the T cells uh, on, on what, is, what is present, and the particular antigens that are presented that represent certain pathogens and the kinds of cytokines that the dendritic cells present all influence the outcome, whether it's going to be skewed to B cells 
or T cells or both. So this is all uh, a consequence of the T helper cells. And the dendritic cells actually contact these helper cells in the lymph nodes. And that contact, and again, the, whatever information is exchanged in the form of peptides or cytokines, depend, determines whether uh, these will be Th1 or Th2 cells. And that determines, in, in turn, whether they are going to stimulate the production of CTLs or antibody-producing cells. So the Th2, of course, will make B cells, and the Th1 helper cells will make CTLs. So that's where the decision is made as to what is going to be made preferentially and what will eventually uh, prevent infection. So as I said, Th1 cells turn on killer T cells by the particular cocktail of cytokines uh, that they produce. And this is what clears most viral infections. Clears, not protects against, clears most viral infections. A Th2 response will mainly activate B cells and enhance the production of antibodies. Exclusively doing this is not good for most viral infections. Uh, this is okay for bacteria and worm infections and so forth, but uh, viral infections prefer to have uh, a Th1 response. But there are cases where you have a balance of both, and you make a, a little of both, and it's important. But again, how the balance is determined is by the mix of cytokines that the DCs make when they go into the lymph node initially and interact with those T helper cells. And that the peptides and the cytokines will determine the outcome of that signaling. The last thing I want to talk about is memory. All of these responses, these adaptive responses, result in memory. Now, the innate response has no memory. Once the infection is over, the, the innate response is still as active as it ever was. And you don't really need memory to get it going again. But adaptive responses, both B cell and T cell responses, have memory. So if you get infected again, if you've survived and you get infected again, you can make a really rapid and specific response to that pathogen to prevent reinfection. So no, no, innate, no memory in innate responses. And this is the basis for vaccination. This is why vaccines work. And I'm going to tell you, show you two examples of memory uh, to, to close out. First is antibody memory or B cell memory. And here we're looking at time after infection and serum antibody titer. So we inject an antigen here, uh, antigen A in the red. You get a primary response after two to four weeks, a primary uh, antibody response in the serum. And then that goes away as the, the antigen is cleared. The level of antibody goes down because there's no need to make it continuously. And then if you then uh, inject antigen A later, uh, you get a secondary response, which is more rapid. It only takes a short amount of time, and it's more robust. You can see higher titers uh, of antibody. And if you at the same time in injected a antigen B, along with antigen A, you can see that B pr produces a primary response, just like A did when you first put it in. So it's sort of an internal control to make sure that this is specific for the memory peptide or, or antigen. So that's memory, and it consists of memory B cells that remain after uh, the infection, which are specific for the antigen. Remember, those B cells were selected in the uh, lymph node uh, by many rounds of selection and mutation, and they are specific for the pathogen. So you don't have to go through all that selection again if the pathogen comes back. That's why the memory response is so quick. There are also uh, memory cellular responses. Makes sense. Here's an experiment very similar to the one uh, before. Uh, where we are looking at time after infection and, and CTLs. And here on the top is virus titer. So we infect these animals at day zero. Uh, you have virus here. It's in the spleen. Virus in the spleen goes up, and then it comes down. And the recovery from infection, it depends on the presence of a, of a cytotox cytotoxic T cell response. On the bottom panel, we are looking at two kinds of CD8 cells. Uh, one is called effector CD8 cells. And this means that these cells can lyse specifically virus-infected cells. All right, so these are antigen-specific CD8 cells. So you see they rise up uh, very quickly, uh, just about after the virus titer. And then they go back down again, because you don't need them anymore. The infection is cleared. But you see that there are also present uh, epitope-specific CD8 cells for as long as this experiment was run. So these are not cells that will kill infected cells, but they are specific 
uh, for the antigen. They have receptors on their surface which will recognize a peptide derived from your virus, say. Those are the memory uh, CD8 cells, and those will always be present at a certain level so that if you get infected again, they will come up very quickly to make effector uh, CD8s which will help recover. So most of the vaccines that we use today uh, make antibody memory, but as I said, there's increasing uh, evidence that some cellular responses are important for protection. So there's also quite a bit of effort going into developing um, cellular vaccines as well, which are, are quite different from the vaccines that induce antibodies. <laughs>